and I'm in a fog, and I go into, the one thing you can tell you when you get arrested, there are two things that never happen. It is never quiet, and it is never dark. First at five, nearly four years after her husband's murder, romance novelist Nancy Crampton Brophy stepped into the spotlight like never before, taking the witness stand in her own defense, testifying about the strength of the couple's relationship and the loss she says she suffered since Dan Brophy was shot twice. A crime prosecutor say she committed for money. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm David Molko and I'm Laurel Porter. Crampton Brophy's defense team has largely argued before the jury essentially that she couldn't have committed murder because she loved her husband too much. Brian Clerkley has been following the trial for us for the last six weeks. Brian Nancy was on the stand for several hours today. Yeah, more than six hours. Laurel and David all day cross examination started this afternoon, so that'll finish up at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. A lot of the testimony focused on Daniel and Nancy's financial history, the business they started, and their love for each other. She was also asked about the day her husband died, and Nancy seemed eager to tell jurors her story. You're just not as good as you were when you were with him. When you were with him. You were the best you could be when you were together with him. Emotional testimony as Nancy Crampton Brophy took the stand in her own defense. She's accused of shooting and killing her husband, Daniel Brophy. On Monday morning, Nancy spoke about what it's been like to live the past four years without Daniel. Now, it's like, yeah, I function, but there's something missing. The couple's financial history has been a big part of the trial, with the prosecution arguing Nancy killed Daniel to cash in on an insurance policy worth more than $1 million. Nancy told jurors about past business ventures, including a catering company she eventually sold. Nancy said she and her husband did experience money issues, but the most important thing was maintaining happiness. We chose happiness over anything else. And so if he's happy, and he's not making as much money, that didn't bother us, you know. Throughout the trial, the defense tried to paint a picture of a couple who have been deeply in love throughout their marriage. Several of the Brophy's friends and family members testified and said the couple seemed happy. Nancy described her relationship as unique. I would say, when I told you Dan thought outside the box and maybe didn't even lived outside the box, yeah, uh, but I would say I did the same. You know, we made choices that other people wouldn't have made. The state claims Nancy's van was spotted on surveillance in the area of the Oregon Culinary Institute the morning Daniel Brophy was murdered. During cross-examination, prosecutors asked Nancy about her husband being well-liked within the community. You know, I was delighted that people thought so highly of this man, and, and with reason, he was smart. The judge says he would like to wrap up the trial by May 20th. Last week, there was a motion hearing on whether to allow Nancy's former cellmate, Andrea Jacobs, to testify. The judge did rule that Jacobs would be allowed to testify. Laurel? It was riveting to hear from Nancy. Thank you, Bryant. Now to a troubling story out of Northeast Portland, where a decades-old church was vandalized overnight. The pastor at Maranatha Church calls what? calls it a hate crime and hopes police can track down whoever is responsible. Mike Benner joins us from Maranatha Church with more, including details, Mike, on a second crime. Yeah, Laurel, according to church staffers here at Maranatha Church, somebody sawed off and stole the catalytic converter on this church van right here. While frustrating, it does not appear to be connected to the vandalism that people here at the church say is far worse. Let's go ahead and take a look at the south side of the church in Northeast Portland. It is covered in graffiti. This is believed to have been done between late Sunday evening and early Monday morning. Some of the disturbing phrases that were spray painted were 666. That's the mark of the beast according to the pastor then there was the word satan and kaboom which of course can imply bomb or shooting the pastor says the whole thing is just heartbreaking when i was a kid and we were walking past the church and my brother and i we were going to swear we would stop before we got to the church when we went past the church we would just let it fly if you will right and so when i think of that and then come to the church and see the 
audacity, the unmitigated gall of someone to come and vandalize a church, it, it really, it, it concerns me. It, it's hurtful to say the least. Yeah, anyone with information about the vandalism or the catalytic converter theft is urged to contact the Portland Police Bureau. Back to you. Mike Benner reporting. Thank you, Mike. And that vandalism, only a fraction of a horrific weekend of hate and violence across the U.S. A total of 11 people were killed in shootings that investigators are calling hate crimes. Yesterday in Southern California, police say 68 year old David Chow opened fire at a church in Laguna Woods. One person died. Five others were hurt. Police say the suspect was motivated by political tensions between China and Taiwan. Beijing has long considered the island a breakaway province. Police say the gunman targeted members of the Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church who shared a worship space with another congregation there. And that shooting followed Saturday's horrific attack when a white gunman motivated by racial hate police say shot 13 people at a supermarket in Buffalo, killing 10 of them. Now, they include a former police officer and a grandmother. Authorities say the alleged shooter, 18-year-old Peyton Gendron, specifically picked a store in a predominantly black neighborhood. Now, 11 of the 13 shooting victims are black. Their families are grieving tonight, but also pushing for white supremacists and those spreading that hate to be held accountable. Investigators say the shooter had been radicalized online and bought into racist conspiracy theories. Took away my mother and my best friend. How dare you? How dare you? This needs to be fixed. It's just absolutely chilling to know that that kind of hatred, that kind of racism uh, is still um, uh, prevalent in our country. The mayor of Buffalo there, three people survived Saturday's rampage. Two of them are now out of the hospital. The third is in stable condition. Gendron was arrested. His next appearance is on Thursday. Buffalo's police chief says there is also evidence the suspect intended to target a second grocery store. And there's more here. Police say they've arrested one more person accused of making threats after the shooting. Oh, just heart wrenching. Let's take you to Oregon now. Tomorrow is election day. Thousands of ballots are pouring into places like Clackamas County, but there's a big problem there that will likely delay results. Our Pat Doris is here with a look at the in-depth report he's prepared for the 6 p.m. show. The story, Pat. Well, Laurel, it is a huge problem that's going on there. It's causing a lot of work for election crews in Oregon City. The problem is with barcodes on the ballots in the Clackamas County, it's causing nearly two thirds of them to be kicked out and not counted by the voting machines. The county clerk runs elections there and told me the problem is specifically with the barcodes printing on the ballots. They're not quite dense enough, she said, and a tad blurry. That leads to the counting machines just spitting them out. Well, I'm really sorry it happened because we really uh, want to build trust in voters. But because it happened, we had to come up with a solution, which I think the one we have is really the only one we can do. So there is a fix, but it's not quick. And there are likely tens of thousands of ballots affected there in Clackamas County. Two workers, one from each party, are now having to fill out a brand new ballot by hand, make sure it's identical to the ballot that was rejected by the machine, and then feed it back to be counted again. It's quite a process. Time consuming, oh, yes. Yeah, for sure. We'll get into exactly how they make sure it's done correctly tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be watching tonight at 6 and definitely on election night. Thanks Thank you, Pat. Be sure to stay with KGW tomorrow for complete coverage and analysis of the election results. We'll have a special streaming show for you that starts at 7.30 on KGW.com. Then watch KGW News at 11 for complete coverage of the primary.